Um, thank you. 1966 to 2016. What an astonishing 50 years landscape architecture has enjoyed since that declaration of concern was first penned by McCarg and his colleagues in 1966, with so many advances for our field on so many fronts. The rise of environmentalism and ecological planning and design, the ascendancy of multidisciplinary practices, ideas, and influences, the experiments and possibilities put forward by land art and other artists focused on the advancement of landscape, the influence of ser serious historical reflection, design theory and criticism, important cultural and intellectual positionings for the field, advances in digital media and technology as well as new materials, tools and techniques, and of course, the built works themselves. These many projects are impossible to collate here in this short time, but surely a visit to any book bookstore will showcase a host of amazingly exciting and beautifully vibrant landscape architectural projects from all around the world. Projects more colorful, more well-crafted, inventive and diverse than at any previous point in history. This is especially true for what seems like a renaissance period over the past 20 years or so, with massive investment in new large-scale urban public parks, waterfronts, reused infrastructures, public squares, trails, and other public spaces in the city. Many of these projects are multifaceted and both politically and technically complicated, with landscape architects often leading multidisciplinary professional teams to deliver exceptional transformations of cities, turning previously dormant liabilities into new and invaluable assets. The past 50 years have brought new life and vitality to the city, and landscape continues to serve as a powerful influence, if not actual model and trope, for how the city might best evolve into the future. If the 1966 Declaration of Concern focused upon an ecological environment primarily, I would posit that our focus today must be on the creative design of the urban environment, of the city, with all of its social and political dimensions, including the aesthetic and the intellectual, engaged and enmeshed within issues of nature and ecology. From a purely environmentalist perspective, the city is surely the only rational solution for continued population growth on a planet with limited and seriously diminishing natural resources. More than 75% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. By concentrating people in cities, precious land can be better conserved for water, agriculture, um, and resource management, while reducing dependency on private automobiles for long commute times, congestion, and pollution. Cities efficiently concentrate mobility, productivity, culture, lifestyle, and value. If you love nature and countryside, choose to live in the city. Otherwise, little city or wilderness will remain, along with insurmountable challenges to adequately watering and feeding an ever-growing population. With more people, then, cities will inevitably become denser, more compact, and will place urgent demands for new organizational development frameworks that improve mobility, efficiency, and comfort. Landscape architects are well positioned to lead such initiatives because they see the city as a kind of dynamic ecosystem, a layered composite of patches, corridors, networks, nodes, edges, and interfaces, a city landscape of interconnected systems, pathways, and places. More importantly, though, unlike commensurate efforts to improve systems efficiency in cities by planners and engineers, landscape architects can go one step further, striving to embed beauty desire, and pleasure into the system. After all, the city is not just a quantitative problem, but a deeply qualitative one, wherein qualities of place, identity, experience, interaction, and exchange enhance a profound human sense of belonging, community, and enrichment. People should want to live in cities, not because they have no other option, but because the city offers everything they desire, 
Neighbors, friends, schools, restaurants, cafes, theaters, markets, shops, museums, parks, gardens, waterfronts, and ultimately, identity. People live somewhere, and that sense of place counts. Life takes place in the city. It is a physical and psychological experience bound into the buildings, streets, parks, and the physical makeup of a particular place. Much of this experience derives from the public realm, much of it designed by landscape architects, often in uniquely specific ways that make places peculiar to a particular place and city, belonging to a, a particular place and time. Public places offer exposure to locality, to nature, to greenery, to birdsong, but also exposure to others, to the cosmopolitanism of diversity and culture, to the joys and pleasures of being amongst others in particular atmospheres, weathers, and places. These are collective spaces for both the individual and the group, the young and the old, the escapist and the crowd, the exhibitionist and the voyeur, spaces for everybody in a colorful, open, and cosmopolitan democracy. So here we have our shared mandate, a new declaration, if you will. Landscape architects must take on the challenges for shaping and forming the future city in terms that are both quantitative and qualitative, both ecological and social, both pragmatic and poetic. Quantitatively, landscape architects must help improve the organizational systems, frameworks, pathways, and places that structure mobility, community, economy, lifestyle, and resources such as water, air, food, and natural habitat. Landscape architects should be working on initiatives involving transportation, climate change resiliency, infrastructure, urban agriculture, stormwater management, waste management, and urban design development structure, including blocks, streets, open spaces, and connective tissue. Intelligent urban structuring for the 21st century city is essential for social democracy, for human health and well-being, for ecological sustainability, and for economic competitiveness. At the same time, landscape architects must also work qualitatively to imbue the city with beauty and character, with richly varied, artfully designed public places, from the smallest pocket park to the urban square to the largest urban park system, all places that uplift the human spirit, promote open and cosmopolitan forms of social interaction, and create unique places around which people can interact, center, and belong. Of course, the city may always be primarily motivated by economic imperatives, real estate, commerce, and profit. But as a humanistic endeavor, the city should also be a beautifully designed place for public life and pleasure. The city should be a well-organized framework that allows life to take place efficiently, productively, and comfortably. But it should also be a richly textured and idiosyncratic platform that maximizes exposure to otherness, to difference, to the unforeseen, to the wild, to the promiscuous, and to the very essence of the social. The city needs to be designed as a place of both improved utility and irresistible desire. And hence the virtues and lessons of the garden in its very historical essence. For the garden is a place that requires the utmost technical, pragmatic know-how and care on the one hand, combined with the aesthetic art of design, placemaking, imagination, wonder, and invention on the other. The city as garden elevates experience and pragmatics to poetry and art. As we continue to talk about environmentalism, sustainability, resiliency, and so forth, the mantras of the 1966 Declaration of Concern, we must also draw from the humanistic dimensions of the landscape imagination, prioritizing beautifully designed cities and public spaces as living platforms for socialization, cultural value, and pure human experience. The world of the 21st century is going to be shaped by plural, 
multifaceted identities and by booming cities that celebrate density, diversity, and vibrant forms of public life. Open democracy versus protectionist borders suggests the design of public spaces that are inclusive, porous, and catalytic, interactional and transactional, living spaces of encounter that are beautifully inviting, technically progressive, morally uplifting, and socially edifying. Imaginative projects for a new 21st century garden city. Thank you.